Kings and Queens of England. Part four, the War of the Roses. Keep it in the family. With a third of the population dead from bubonic plague and a 10-year-old boy sitting tentatively on the throne, England was on the brink of major changes in society and bloody conflicts over who would be king. Richard II. Old King Edward's eldest son, Edward the Black Prince, died a year before him, so the next in line was his 10-year-old grandson, who was crowned Richard II. The real power behind the throne was Richard's uncle, John of Gaunt. With a third of the population dead in the wake of the plague, the remaining peasants found that there was more demand for labor than there were people to do it. They abandoned the feudal lands that their families had been enslaved to in search of better pay, and many of them got it, becoming wealthier than ever before. This infuriated the nobles, who saw themselves as inherently superior, so they imposed laws limiting everything from where peasants could live to what types of clothes they could wear. The government issued a tax on every citizen, but they didn't understand that the population had shrunk, so when they didn't raise as much money as they expected, they taxed everyone again. The peasants revolted and demanded the end to all nobility. John of Gaunt was forced into hiding. When the rebel leader, Watt Tyler, finally met the king to issue the people's demands, he was slain by the mayor of London rebels drew their bows and the 14-year-old king rode forward to calm them. He made a speech asking them to obey him and they would be treated fairly. Amazingly, they believed him and dispersed. They shouldn't have trusted the king. After this meeting, the rebel leaders were hunted down and executed. Now hated by the people, King Richard made the nobles hate him as well by pulling out of the war in France that was keeping them rich. Richard tried to rehab his reputation and was the first king of England to have his portrait made. But there was one thing about the king that his medieval people could never forgive. Richard was a homosexual, and as kings before him had, he raised homophobic ire among the nobles. He was captured by his cousin, Henry, and forced to abdicate. He was imprisoned and murdered at 32. With the king dead and childless, who was the rightful king now? The descendants of Edward III were aligning themselves on two sides. The Lancasters, symbolized by the Red Rose, versus the Yorks, symbolized by the White Rose. England was poised for civil war, cousin against cousin, competing for the crown. The House of Lancaster. Henry IV, technically the next in line to the throne after the slain Richard II, was the grandson of King Edward III's second son, an eight-year-old boy named Edmund, living in Ireland. Henry was the son of Edward's third son, and not the rightful king. But as he had just gone to the trouble of murdering the king, he took the crown for himself anyway. Henry's illegal claim to the throne haunted him, and he became increasingly paranoid and oppressive. Anyone who questioned his right to be king would likely be disemboweled. He fought ferociously against an uprising in the north, and was said to have personally killed 30 men. Eventually, his paranoia manifested itself in physical illness, and he retreated from rule. His son ruled in his place until Henry died at 45. Henry V. The next Henry worked to stabilize the kingdom and return to the war with France. The French king, Charles VI, was mentally unstable. He murdered his attendants in a rage and believed that he was made of glass and liable to break at any moment. Henry easily defeated the French and killed a good portion of the French aristocracy at the Battle of Agincourt. He forced Charles to name him heir to the French throne and married Charles' sister, Catherine of Valois. After the victory, everything seemed wonderful for England and their popular young king. But a few months later, at the age of 36, Henry contracted dysentery and died, leaving the throne to his 10-month-old son. Newly widowed, the Queen Mother, Catherine of Valois, began an affair with her servant, a Welshman named Owen Tudor. Remember him. He'll be important later. Henry VI. Shortly after baby King Henry was placed on the throne of England, the King of France died, leaving his crown to the infant as well. The Dauphin, son of the King of France, wanted his father's crown back. The army of France, led by Joan of Arc and emboldened by a new invention, gunpowder, beat the English out of their country. Henry grew into a pious and studious man. He founded Eton and King's College, Cambridge. But he had no interest in warfare, not a good trait for a medieval king. Without his military leadership, England lost nearly all of its territory in France, and the 100 Years' War came to an end in France's favor. To make things worse, King Henry went mad. He probably inherited the same mental disorder as his uncle, Charles VI of France. He lost his memory, control of his body, and the ability to speak. His cousin Richard of York became the regent, but he wanted the crown. Civil war broke out. Henry's family, the Lancasters, and Richard's family, the Yorks, cousin against cousin. King Henry's wife, Margaret of Anjou, made a valiant effort to fight for her husband. She personally commanded the battle in Wakefield in which Richard of York was killed. The House of York. 
Edward IV. After the death of Richard of York, his son Edward had himself declared king. The rightful king, Henry, was still alive, but he and his queen were sent on the run in Scotland. Edward fell in love with the beautiful but poor widow, Elizabeth Woodville. She was English, and Edward ruffled many feathers by choosing her over a political marriage to a foreign princess and even more when he gave Elizabeth's commoner family wealth and position. Edward's grasp on the crown was always shaky. He was surrounded by enemies. When his own brother was found to have plotted against him, Edward had him drowned in a vat of wine. He also had Henry VI's stepfather, Owen Tudor, beheaded, but Tudor's son Edmund was also a powerful rival. He married 13-year-old Margaret Beaufort, a descendant of John of Gaunt, and their son Henry Tudor had a strong double claim to the throne. Edward IV ruled for nine years, but was chased out of England by the French who placed Henry back on the throne. Henry, though a husk of a man, was king again for less than a year. Edward returned from exile with an army. Henry's son was killed in battle, and Henry himself was captured, put into the Tower of London, and murdered while he knelt to pray in his private chapel. Henry Tudor survived and was now the head of the Lancaster family and a major threat to King Edward and his heirs. At 40, Edward contracted an unknown illness. He named his 12-year-old son Edward his heir and his brother Richard regent and died. Edward V. The adolescent Edward V was now king and his appointed regent, his uncle Richard, was on his way to bring the boy king to London for his coronation. Edward's mother, Elizabeth Woodville, didn't trust Richard one bit. Her family hid Edward, but Richard seized him and took him and his younger brother to the Tower of London. He claimed this was for their protection until the coronation could be arranged, but the young princes were never seen again. Conveniently, their uncle uncovered a priest who would swear that Edward IV had been betrothed to a young woman before he married his queen, which would make his marriage invalid and the young King Edward illegitimate. The young princes in the tower, Edward and Richard, were probably murdered. In 1789, workmen in the tower discovered bones belonging to two adolescent boys. For centuries, visitors to the tower have claimed to hear children play near where the boys met their sad demise. With Edward V out of the way, who was next in line? Why, Richard, of course. Richard III had himself declared king and is notorious as one of the most evil kings in English history. In addition to having the princes in the tower done in, he is credited with personally drowning his older brother George in a vat of wine and killing Henry VI heir on the battlefield, then marrying his wealthy widow, Anne Neville. It has also been said that his outsides matched his insides, that he was deformed and hunchbacked. However, Richard's reputation was largely shaped by William Shakespeare. Shakespeare, who was writing under the patronage of a descendant of Richard's arch-nemesis, Henry Tudor. Historians have long debated whether or not this propaganda was true. When Richard's skeleton was discovered under a car park in 2012, it was revealed that Richard suffered from scoliosis, which made one of his shoulders higher than the other. King Richard didn't get to enjoy his ill-gotten crown for long. A year into his reign, Henry Tudor reappeared in England at the head of an army. Richard was killed at the Battle of Bosworth Field, ending the War of the Roses and clearing the throne for a new dynasty the Tudors. Check out the next video to find out what was the deal with Henry VIII chopping off his wives' heads? Why did a cocktail get named after a Tudor queen? And why was Elizabeth I known as the Virgin Queen? Were two young princes really murdered in the Tower of London? Was Richard III really hunchbacked? And how did incest end a century of war? The Kings and Queens of England Part 4, The War of the Roses, Keep It in the Family with a third of the population dead from bubonic plague and a 10-year-old boy sitting tentatively on the throne, England was on the brink of major changes in society and bloody conflicts over who would be king. Richard II Old King Edward's eldest son, Edward, the Black Prince, died a year before him, so the next in line was his 10-year-old grandson, who was crowned Richard II. The real power behind the throne was Richard's uncle, John of Gaunt. With a third of the population dead in the wake of the plague, 
the remaining peasants found that there was more demand for labor than there were people to do it. They abandoned the feudal lands that their families had been enslaved to in search of better pay, and many of them got it, becoming wealthier than ever before. This infuriated the nobles, who saw themselves as inherently superior, so they imposed laws limiting everything from where peasants could live to what types of clothes they could wear. The government issued a tax on every citizen, but they didn't understand that the population had shrunk, so when they didn't raise as much money as they expected, they taxed everyone again. The peasants revolted and demanded the end to all nobility. John of Gaunt was forced into hiding. When the rebel leader, Watt Tyler, finally met the king to issue the people's demands, he was slain by the mayor of London. Rebels drew their bows and the 14-year-old king rode forward to calm them. He made a speech asking them to obey him and they would be treated fairly. Amazingly, they believed him and dispersed. They shouldn't have trusted the king. After this meeting, the rebel leaders were hunted down and executed. Now hated by the people, King Richard made the nobles hate him as well by pulling out of the war in France that was keeping them rich. Richard tried to rehab his reputation and was the first king of England to have his portrait made. But there was one thing about the king that his medieval people could never forgive. Richard was a homosexual, and as kings before him had, he raised homophobic ire among the nobles. He was captured by his cousin, Henry, and forced to abdicate. He was imprisoned and murdered at 32. With the king dead and childless, who was the rightful king now? The descendants of Edward III were aligning themselves on two sides. The Lancasters, symbolized by the Red Rose, versus the Yorks, symbolized by the White Rose. England was poised for civil war, cousin against cousin, competing for the crown. The House of Lancaster. Henry IV, technically the next in line to the throne after the slain Richard II, was the grandson of King Edward III's second son, an eight-year-old boy named Edmund, living in Ireland. Henry was the son of Edward's third son, and not the rightful king. But as he had just gone to the trouble of murdering the king, he took the crown for himself anyway. Henry's illegal claim to the throne haunted him, and he became increasingly paranoid and oppressive. Anyone who questioned his right to be king would likely be disemboweled. He fought ferociously against an uprising in the north,